Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the Seafoods Association of America, and I'm delighted to be here with our three guests this afternoon and a large audience of uh, people who've registered for this program today. I think um, without going back all the way through the records of our 24 past webinars, that this was the best uh, the highest number of registrants for any program, and we're just delighted to um, have such tremendous experts on a topic of such great interest to, to bring the community together this afternoon. Um, as I said, if you're just joining us, my name is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO, and uh, this webinar today is hosted by the Seafoods Association of America. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, I wanted to just give everyone some background. Um, we're delighted to have you with us. This is our 24th webinar of a series that began in 2010 and has continued this year with, uh, I think this is our fourth program this year. Um, just as I logged on, we have had 788 registrants, and I know people always join us once we're in progress, so that number will likely be even higher than that. And through the registration process and emails and other ways, we received literally hundreds of questions for today's uh, speakers. And they have done the, the very generous task of going through all those questions and uh, kind of winnowing down and finding the overlap and have come back uh, to address, address the top 10 uh, most asked questions about post-exertional relapse, post-exertional malaise. Um, based on uh, not only their many years' experience in the field, but also what our audience wanted to hear most this afternoon. Um, for those of you for whom this is your first webinar, just to um, give you a little insight into how these programs unfold, the folks at the Pacific Fatigue Lab are in one place, and I am in a separate place. Luckily, all three of them are together in the same room, and they'll have the benefit of eye contact, body language. Um, I won't have that benefit because I'm probably 3,500 miles from where they are in North Carolina. So we'll have to use um, maybe some uh, outright verbal communication. We also have a little chat box, but just so all of you know, we, we aren't in the same place and can't see one another, and obviously you can't see us and we can't see you, so we're all a little bit hindered by uh, the technology, but still all in all, this is a great way to deliver uh, information at low cost and uh, without the, the hassle of travel and booking a ballroom and, and all the other logistics that go into live conferencing. We are recording today's presentation, and hopefully it will um, go smoothly, and we'll be able to get the recording and the slides posted on our <clears throat> YouTube channel within a day or two of today's program. So uh, don't feel that you have to, to make notes unless you want to, because this will be available in those two formats after the fact. We asked some questions about the program as uh, people were registering, and these are the answers. Um, I won't take time to go through them all, but all, uh, as is typical, <clears throat> almost all of the registrants are people with CFS or have a loved one uh, in their family or their lives uh, that is struggling with the illness, and, and that is the main um, audience for today's program. So we've taken that into account. Um, 58% of the registrants said that post-exertional malaise is a constant problem for them, and another 25% um, felt similarly and uh, are working uh, actively to try to adapt to the problems that post-exertional malaise poses. Um, about 56% said they're somewhat familiar with the published research, and so our speakers have taken that figure into to consideration that about half the audience uh, may not be familiar with that research. So if there is some review built into the program, uh, hopefully the 56% who already know that information will bear with the others uh, who may not be as, as uh, well informed about it. And then we have about half the audience who has participated in a past webinar and half who have not, and that's a little bit uh, more balanced, but usually is about 70% or return webinar, so uh, return webinar participants, so we're delighted to have reached an even broader audience with this program. 
Uh, by way of introduction, I'm delighted to um, have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Snell and Dr. Van Ness and Stacey Stevens from the Pacific Fatigue Lab at the University of Pacific. And I think it's always interesting to um, just know where they are. They're out here kind of in the, the central part of California, uh, in Stockton, California. And all three of them have been involved in this field for, gosh, 15, 20 years, guys, help me out. I know I know news almost as long as I've been involved, so uh, quite a bit of time. Um, Dr. Snell is a professor of health, exercise, and sports sciences at University of Pacific. Some of you may also know him as the former chairman of the federal CFS advisory committee. During Dr. Snell's uh, tenure as chair of that committee, that they started webcasting those meetings, and so uh, his voice and uh, his picture may be familiar to you from that. Uh, Stacy Stevens is the founding executive director of the Pacific Fatigue Lab. She uh, formerly served as a member of the CFS advisory committee. I don't remember that their terms overlapped at any time, but um, Stacy's been a, a valuable uh, member both from a research and clinical perspective and also um, in her role as a patient advocate. And then Dr. Mark Van Ness is an associate professor of health exercise and sports sciences also at University of Pacific and um, has led most of the research studies that the group has done um, in a number of settings uh, to better understand post-exertional malaise and its impact on, on patient care and the disability um, the patients experience from a vocational standpoint and how to document that for uh, whether it's Social Security or long-term disability uh, insurers. So um, without further ado, I will turn the program over to our speakers both figuratively and literally, and now we're going to make the switch so that you can see uh, their slide presentation. There'll be a brief delay while they bring that up. Can you guys still hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me, Kim? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. There you are. Great. Great. So this, this is a picture. Can you hear me? Are we ready to go? You're ready to go. Go for it. Uh, all right. So just as, as a little credit, Kim has provided us with a lovely introduction. This is Stacy. Uh, the, the picture on your screen is a picture of our Burns water tower at the University of the Pacific. And I am going to uh, allow Chris to start with our first question. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Van Ness. Yeah, that's me. Um, the first question, number one, is just really what is post exertional malaise or um, as we in the title slide, post-exertional relapse. Um, it's a diagnostic term that's used in the CFS criteria. Um, and whether we're talking about post-exertional malaise or post-exertional relapse, uh, all CFS patients pretty much know what we're talking about. It's uh, usually the result of um, overdoing it, um, and it causes a flare-up of um, symptoms. Um, it's an, either an amplification of already existing feelings of fatigue and tiredness, or even new, new um, symptoms um, appearing that follows um, excessive, usually physical exertion. Um, it increases in levels of fatigue, uh, more or more intense pain, uh, diminished brain function, and then there's a variety of other immune, cardiovascular, and metabolic symptoms that go along with uh, post-exertional malaise. So throughout this talk, when we're referring to post-exertional malaise or post-exertional relapse, um, this is what we're talking about. And I think Dr. Snell is going to take um, question number two. Uh, so, uh, Chris Snell, uh, yeah. how post exertional malaise being measured? Uh, that's where our, our current interests lie, and, and, and we're making uh, attempts now to, to quantify post exertional malaise. But uh, the, the story behind this started, as uh, uh, Kim said, probably 15, 20 years ago. And as you heard, our background is exercise science. So up until the point that we started to get involved in chronic fatigue syndrome research, our major interest has been athletic performance. And one of the things that we're interested in with athletes is fatigue and recovery. Uh, and so when we started to, to look at the, the field of chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, we thought, well, we have mechanisms here that we can use to actually measure fatigue. Uh, and we use exercise testing. 
think we measure oxygen consumption and have been an indicator of work efficiency. Fatigue really simply is a reduced efficiency as a result of doing work. And so we, we thought, well, we've got a very made measure here that uh, will allow us to quantify fatigue. And so we, we got involved in a, a clinical trial in chronic fatigue syndrome. We had access to a large number of patients that we, we put through strenuous exercise tests and collected a wealth of data on those patients. And we were lucky enough to be able to produce a number of research publications uh, on those results. Uh, could you get closer to your microphone? Um, people are having a hard time hearing you. So from, from that clinical trial in chronic fatigue syndrome, we got a lot of data that led to a number of research publications, uh, the establishment of the Pacific Fatigue Lab, and ultimately our interest in disability evaluation. Um, one of the things that we got out of these early research studies was, was a, something about a puzzle for us. Um, we got a wide, wide variety of what we call functional outcomes across a range of patients. Some patients appeared to be very disabled during the exercise test. Other patients were functioning at somewhat of a normal level. Uh, however, when we looked at uh, post-exercise questionnaires, because our background is athletes and we're interested in individual performance, we followed up all of our exercise tests with an individual questionnaire asking patients how they felt following the test. And even without re reading the graphs up on the screen, you can see a clear difference between symptom expression in the patients compared to the controls. And what we were seeing that even patients that had fairly normal exercise test results, there was a, a significant post-exertional effect uh, on fatigue, and then a progression of symptoms that waxed and waned over a period up to uh, seven days beyond the test. This puzzled us. So, so what we did, we, we got our heads together and we decided, well, what if we gave them a second test would that actually give us an objective measure of fatigue following the initial exertion, which we chose to be an indicator of post-exertion related. And so the effects of the first test are that it produces uh, an effect that we would see on the second test. And then a large number of patients, and particularly those patients that we were giving fairly normal results on the first test, um, we would see a decrement in performance on the second test. And so for us, that was a clear objective measure of post-exertional relief. The other added benefit for us, not necessarily for the patients who were not enjoying the double exercise tests, was that it was guaranteed that the second test is going to induce post-exertional relapse or a whole range of symptoms. And so we started to group those symptoms under a variety of different headings. And what we believe, and, and a large number of, of researchers in the chronic fatigue syndrome community believe this also, is that we can also measure all of these symptoms. Um, what the, the debate is now about, what do we use to measure them? We believe that we have a, a solid, valid, and reliable measure of fatigue in a standardized exercise test. We also believe that provides a standardized stressor for inducing symptoms. It's a matter then of finding the appropriate instruments to ask the right questions and accurately assess uh, the other symptoms of post exertion relapse. And question three. Will be answered by uh, Stacey Stevens. My question is: What is the difference between short duration and long duration post-exertional malaise? Now, this is a tricky question because, to our knowledge, none of the literature 
out there addresses this question. And so the simple answer is that we don't really know. But we have some good ideas. And I think those include individual differences. So for example, not everyone expresses the same symptoms when they get a common cold. And so you would expect different people to respond differently. Uh, around here, uh, we work at, at a university, and so around finals weeks, our students will get stressed and they'll get sick. And so they'll come into our lab, uh, they'll come into the classrooms, they'll have colds, and if they keep stressing themselves and keep exercising, those symptoms will be amplified. And pretty soon they'll come back in hacky and coughing and they'll develop bronchitis. And if they don't stop and rest and take care of themselves, that may progress to pneumonia. So that would be a long-term exacerbation of symptoms due to an immune response or an immune system that isn't adequately recovering. And I think the answer to this, in part, is that it requires overall activity balance. And that can help prevent this extremely long duration post-exertional relapse or exacerbation of symptoms. I think it also has to do with how far you push. So the longer a patient pushes, the harder a patient pushes. If they ignore their symptoms because they have things they have to do, that can create an additional long duration relapse. Now, our research has looked at some of this. And we know patients don't recover. This is the hallmark symptom of this illness. In our studies that we looked at, within 24 hours, 85% of our healthy controls indicated that they had recovered fully uh, within one day. However, 0%, none of our CFS patients had recovered. The remaining 15% of the controls recovered within 48 hours, but the symptoms that they reported, and this slide previously was shown by Dr. Snell, uh, they have some muscle soreness, some delayed onset muscle soreness, which is not unexpected with an exercise test. I think one person reported a headache. So it was a completely different profile from our patients. On the other hand, you can see the average days to recovery for our patients from a single exercise test was over four days, which means that, that one patient recovered within two days, but the rest of them didn't recover for four days. And that also means that some of those patients took longer than four days to recover. And the other thing that we see with the two-day test is surprisingly some, some patients recover within two to four days and others don't recover for seven days or longer. And that's as long as we keep the recovery questionnaire, but we certainly know that for some patients, it takes a couple of weeks, it takes a couple of months, uh, and it often puts patients in a relapse. Number four, Dr. Snell. Uh, this question really illustrates you know, how devastating that this illness can be. And one of the basic components, one of the basic activities of daily living is personal hygiene. And, and when we talk to patients, you know, what we, we generally ask them what sort of things that, that do you have difficulty doing? And very commonly, people mention showering with some embarrassment. Uh, and so we, we thought that this was a nice illustration of, of our approach to measuring functional capacity fatigue and post-exertional malaise. The number you see underneath the question, that's 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute of oxygen use, is a, a documented energy requirement for the average person to actually take a shower. So this is how much energy it costs to take a shower. And a key concept here is the concept of something called anaerobic threshold. Very simply, this is the point at which the body switches from using oxygen to metabolize uh, sugars, glucose, carbohydrates, to using uh, energy stored as sugar only to generate energy. It's the difference between an all-out sprint 
and uh, a distance lane. For a normal person, uh, after an all-out sprint, a brief rest allows them to recharge the body and they're ready for the next sprint. Uh, in the past, that light is a, li a little to a Prius, a hybrid car, where you have the gas engine that uses oxygen to enable it to burn uh, gasoline and produce energy, and then you've got the electric battery, which drives an electric motor, and that is recharged by the, the gasoline engine. Uh, when the battery runs out of energy, the electricity will not work anymore until it's been recharged. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is like being a hybrid car where the gas engine doesn't work. All you have is the electric motor. When you run out of energy in the electric motor, the gas engine is unable to satisfactorily recharge that motor. And so what we do during our exercise test, among the parameters we collect, is that we measure that anaerobic threshold. It's really the limit for sustaining work. Um, and most of our patients, when we test them, fall in the these are American Heart Association criteria for, for uh, cardiac and respiratory diseases. Most of our patients fall in the moderate to severe or severe category. Uh, and you'll see in red that their anaerobic thresholds are between, are either less than eight up to 11 milliliters per kilogram per minute. If you remember the first slide in this sequence, taking a shower has an energy cost of 40 milligrams uh, per kilogram per minute. So for most of these people, taking a shower is above their anaerobic threshold. It's the equivalent of an all-out sprint. And because of the consequences of the illness, they do not recover from that all-out sprint. They go into post-exertion relapse. They suffer a uh, range of symptoms that, that were uh, provided on an earlier slide. Could you, could you get closer, please, to the microphone? Sure. Can you hear me, Kim? I, yep. You're, you're coming through the clearest, Stacy. Really? Yeah. I'm always my daughter are more garbled. So um, whichever one of you is speaking, the closest you can get to the microphone would be really helpful to the audience. Great, will do. Thanks. So, so question five is what defines a push crash cycle? And, and from my perspective over the years, I think that this is an automatic response. Uh, that patients defer to this uh, consciously or unconsciously because they don't have control of their, over their illness. And so the natural response is when they get a little bit of energy, they want to get things done. And so they don't know when they'll have another uh, bout of energy, and so they go absolutely crazy, do as much as they possibly can, and then they crash and burn. And so while it's completely understandable, and if you have no control over this illness, that's exactly what you would intuitively do. The problem is that overdoing results in exceeding the anaerobic threshold, causes post-exertional malaise, and causes a crash. And so the goal that we would recommend would be to balance your activities to avoid symptom flare-up. And the beauty of this is that knowing about the anaerobic threshold then gives you a choice to control the illness. So instead of having no control over your illness, no idea when you'll have energy to do the tasks that you want to do, you can use the threshold as a guide. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to stop every time your heart rate exceeds the anaerobic threshold. But it does mean you can choose to do activities and, and gain a little bit of balance. And for example, at, you know, every patient that we work with, this is what we recommend. And what they report back to us is when they start to do this, they start to avoid having crashes all the time. And so wouldn't it be a wonderful world for patients 
if they could control when they crashed or prevent relapses altogether or predict relapses. And that's exactly what you can do. And you can do it very successfully and very scientifically because it's what we recommend for athletes. It's what athletes have done for years and years. They use this concept. They use a heart rate monitor. And they know when they exceed their threshold, they're done. And so it's the same concept for patients that this push-crash cycle, that this constant overdoing because of a lack of illness control can be prevented to a large degree. Anything to add, question mark, about that? Okay. Number six. Number six um, is what are examples of life events that cause symptom flare-ups? Um, Dr. Snell talked about doing the exercise testing to induce post exertion of a leg, and Stacy just talked about that push crash cycle um, that you'd like to try to avoid. But the pictures you see up here don't necessarily involve physical events. These are pictures of celebrations or socials, uh, significant life events um, that involve a lot of social interaction. That picture of the child there could represent um, family changes like moving, uh, job changes, uh, family get-togethers. And I think what needs to be recognized is not only do those activities involve um, more physical activity than normal, they can also involve emotions, um, personal interactions that can often push someone beyond their normal limits. And that can lead to a, a symptom flare-up. And it's the combination of the physical activity, emotional, and psychological events that typically interact to exacerbate symptoms. Um, Hans Selye had his theory of stress, and in that theory, basically divided stress into um, stressful activities that were positive and invigorating, and they called those used stress or good stress, um, whereas negative life events or things that stressed people out were distress. Um, and uh, most people have both good stress and bad stress in their lives, but it seems for uh, a patient with chronic fatigue, stress, chronic fatigue syndrome, both the eustress and the distress can precipitate symptom flare-ups, um, and so those need to be uh, metered out a bit. Um, and like Dr. Snell talked about, with the charging of the battery in between those, um, allow a period of time and a recognition of those events. Um, so hopefully that uh, those can be recharged in between. So I think it needs to be recognized that not only uh, physical activity can cause symptom flare-ups, but also emotional, um, psychological, uh, family get-togethers can do the same thing. Stacey, you have a comment? Yeah, uh, I, I think that for most patients, they think of symptom flare-up and post-exertional delays in terms of overdoing physical activities. And, and there are a lot of different types of energy that are not physical, like Mark just mentioned. Um, you, you get upset, you get angry with a, with a, a family member or, or a friend. Your heart rate goes up. You've exceeded your anaerobic threshold through that emotional stress. The Olympics are coming up. I always get really excited about the Olympics. When the U.S. team is on the podium, I get emotional, I'm cheering up, I've been cheering for my team. Just that could cause a CFS patient to exceed their, their anaerobic threshold. That's not a physical activity, but it's an emotional activity. Cognitive stress is something that we'll get to, but, but that is another type of energy that can cause post-exertion delays. And then when you begin to combine these different types of activity, physical activity with mental activity and emotional activity, those things like weddings and funerals become very energy-draining events, going to church, where you physically have to be someplace. You're socially interacting. You're mentally having to attend to the conversation. You know, that's a triple threat energy situation. So the more types of energy that you combine can create the perfect storm for you to develop post-exertional malaise. And so beginning to learn to identify those different types of energy can be really helpful so that you can predict what type of event may really be exhausting for you and may cause symptom flare-ups. I feel for most of you out there, I don't actually need to answer this question. Um, I, 
I believe that anybody that's had the illness for a length of time has a pretty good idea of the sorts of things that make them sick. Uh, and, but I will answer the question. I mean, it goes back to, to the, the showering issue. Uh, showering, a basic activity of daily life, the social pressure to shower is enormous, the personal pressure to shower is enormous. So even if showering makes you sick, you're going to shower. Um, I think the key things are acknowledging the things that you used to do and didn't even think about now potentially can make you sick. So, so it's acknowledging that, yes, I am ill, uh, even though people are telling you it's all in your head, let me assure you it isn't. Uh, you are really sick. Uh, listen to your heart rate. If your heart rate's racing, then you're probably doing an activity that's going to bring on symptoms. Listen to your body. Recognize first symptoms of overdoing it. Uh, keep, keep a daily log. Um, what, what do you do each day? You know, mark the days that you feel ill. Uh, what were you doing immediately prior to, to, to that relapse? Having said that, uh, for, for people that live, need a little more help, uh, as a byproduct to our disability evaluations, we, we have some numbers that are not only useful in courts or to help with social security claims, they can also be used personally to help control uh, post-exertional malaise. And so we have a measure of that thing called anaerobic threshold, which we believe and the evidence suggests that that's the energy expenditure at which uh, you're likely to precipitate symptoms. So we know where that is. Uh, we have an absolute measure for it. We also have a corresponding heart rate for that measure. So we recommend that all of our patients that have a little problem with self-control get a heart rate monitor, and they wear it all of the time. They set their alarm at about 10 beats less than where we've indicated their anaerobic threshold off is. When the alarm goes off, stop doing whatever you're doing. Make everybody around you aware that I'm wearing a heart rate monitor. My medical professionals, my healthcare professionals have told me I need to stop doing things when that alarm goes off, uh, can you help me with that? Uh, and we find that people who do benefit from them, uh, people will step in and say, oh, no, let me do that for you. Because people are not always aware of, of the activities that will make a person with chronic fatigue syndrome ill. They're, they're, they're so basic sometimes that even a very close family member will completely have a mental block that, well, uh, all this person is doing is putting away the shopping. You know, how can that possibly make them sick? And your requirements to make putting away shopping are above uh, the level for a moderately to severely disabled individual. So wear the heart rate, set the alarm appropriately. When the heart rate, when the alarm goes off, take a break, take a rest, wait until you're fully recovered before you begin activity again. Well, uh, having said that, I'll tell you a little story about a patient in our, that we actually went out to see about in my program. Can you get closer again? You're fading out. I think I just launched into to one of my little anecdotes about a patient that we went to see about a month ago. And, and we, we've given this patient uh, instructions for the heart rate monitor. And so I asked her, how's the heart rate monitor thing going? She said, oh, uh, uh, I stopped wearing it. I said, well, why? She says, well, it keeps going off every time I try to do something. That's the point. So uh, you really have to acknowledge that, yes, if I'm going to stop post-exertional malaise, I really need to take care of myself. I need to pay attention to my body. I need to pay attention to the technology. And when it tells me that I should stop, I stop. Otherwise, be prepared to suffer the consequences. Chris, can I ask a question about the, um, for the folks who haven't had the benefit of, of coming to the Pacific Fatigue Lab or one of the other labs um, that you've trained to do these kinds of tests, is there a way for folks to know what that level is that they should try to stay under? Is there some measure, a rough measure of thumb that they could use to know how to set their heart rate monitor um, to the oxygen test? 
if, if you do monitor your heart rate, if you can do it by trial and error. Uh, if you can get a, a well-established resting heart rate, so you take your heart rate uh, when you wake up before you get up in the morning, five consecutive days, uh, and, and get the number that seems about right. Uh, take your heart rate when you do a range of, of activities. Um, uh, from a low level to strenuous, and for the heart rate of the strenuous activities, you probably want to cut that by about 20% uh, and 30%, and use that as a starting point and, and see how well you do. And so you may get a couple of occasions where you, you go into relapse, uh, and if you know what your heart rate was there, then you know that that's a trigger point and just back off from it. So it, it, it's not as safe as the other way, but say, most of our patients ignore the heart rate monitors initially anyway, so, so they're only doing the same thing. If they just have a heart rate monitor on while well, they, they exceed their anaerobic threshold. And so it, it's a matter of trial and error and just being aware of what is my body doing when I engage in these sorts of activities. Uh, just a comment, Tim. Um, that's, it's a great question, and the problem is for athletes. We can't look at an athlete and tell them what their anaerobic threshold is. We can give them a range, and it's even harder for patients because it's not the same from one day to the next day. So that, during the two-day test, we'll measure a heart rate at their anaerobic threshold on a good day when they've come in, and then it can drop pretty dramatically the second day. So we always err on the side of caution and give them the lowest heart rate. It's always lower than the patient thinks it is or should be. And that, that's the reason why, you know, they want to throw it out the window once they start monitoring. It's very frustrating because if you can't take a shower without exceeding that threshold, then the heart rate monitor will be, and your heart rate will be at 130. I've had patients tell me their heart rate is 180 when they're taking a shower. You know, you, you think about that, and it's shocking, and and yet that's what it is. So not only do patients need to err on the side of caution, you know, rarely is it ever over 110 or 115, and that's on our fittest patients. So it's not uncommon for it to be in the 90, and that doesn't give most patients a very large functional window but it does indicate that they have not recovered, and that's something that is very common. And the, the other problems are medications. So there's a variety of medications that, that people with chronic fatigue syndrome may be taking that actually blunt your heart rate. And so using uh, population heart rates to, to estimate where you should be is, is not a useful thing to do. So it is very individual. But if the person does pay attention to what happens, then, then they can get a, a reasonable idea of uh, how their heart rate varies throughout the day and, and how it varies by uh, individual activities. Yeah, we're, I'm getting a lot of questions about people who are on like beta blockers for their orthostatic intolerance symptoms and how that um, heart rate variability will play into the orthostatic intolerance piece of this um, and maybe affect the readings that they're getting via the heart rate monitors. So uh, as you've all pointed out, those are all important considerations. Uh, and it is very individual. It's one of the difficult things about the illness. It does not affect, there's a lot of common factors, but there are so many individual variances that, that make it very difficult to make broad statements about what people should and should not do. And one other tool that we found to be extremely helpful is the perceived exertion scale. And this is a rating of how hard a patient feels they're working. And we use it not only during the exercise test, but clinically, uh, in all sorts of population, including heart disease. Heart disease patients who are in cardiac rehab are all on beta blockers. And so instead, they can't use their heart rate to estimate how hard they should be exercising during cardiac rehab or how hard their activity should be. So they use this perceived rate of exertion. So while their heart rate may or may not go up uh, and likely won't go up, if, it start, if activities start to feel hard, 
it goes back to listening to your body, like Chris was talking about. And what patients, I think, have a hard time with is they think that because grocery shopping or doing the laundry or taking a shower is hard, they feel guilty about that because that shouldn't be difficult. And so instead of listening to their bodies and their, their bodies are telling them, I'm feeling tired and this is really a hard activity, they don't stop. They push through that. And so tuning into how you feel and instead of denying it or ignoring it, acknowledging it. I think like Chris said, our patients know that when we tell them your anaerobic threshold is so low, you can't, you don't have the metabolic capacity to do these tasks, they know that. It's just that they're not willing to necessarily acknowledge that that's even possible. Because then, number one, they have to acknowledge that they're really sick, that it's not psychological, it is physiological. And they need to learn to pay attention to how hard they feel they're working. And it, activities need to feel very light. They need to be easy to do. And when they become hard, that's a really good indication that they're approaching or exceeding that threshold. Uh, and it's, it's that acknowledging that, that even simple activities are, are, are too much for, for the person. And, and it's not unique to, to chronic fatigue syndrome. The, the functional levels that we measure in patients, we, we use the same sort of tests that they use for, for cardiac patients and respiratory patients. They use these tests to evaluate whether somebody would be uh, likely to survive a heart transplant. A large number of our patients, if they had cardiac disease, they wouldn't get a heart transplant because the odds of them surviving it are not good enough. Um, the same as six-minute walk test that people might be uh, aware of with, with the PACE trial. But there's been uh, studies done with it, and that was invented or designed because the 12-minute walk test was too much for cardiac patients. It's supposed to be a sub-maximal test. It's supposed to keep people below the level of maximum exertion. Uh, they, they did a study a short while ago on a large group of heart patients where they also measured their oxygen consumption. And they found that at least 50% of the heart patients were actually giving out maximal effort on a six-minute walk test. We're reasonably confident that for a majority of the patients that we see, a six-minute walk test would be a maximal test because walking at, at two to two and a half miles an hour exceeds the anaerobic threshold for, for many of our patients. Any other questions, Kim, on, on that topic? Okay, we're moving on to question number eight. Sorry, Stacey, I was muted because I was typing. Um, a few people have asked if there's any way to change the anaerobic threshold so that eventually that number can push a bit higher and more activities of daily living are better tolerated. Yes, and, and that's, that's absolutely the goal. So our whole idea, and, and I'll, uh, I'm going to get to this on this question, so it's a perfect intro to my next question. Uh, if you say, stay at or under your heart rate at your threshold, the idea is that you prevent symptom flare-up and likely immune system flare-up, so you give yourself a chance to recover. You not only give yourself permission to rest and recover, you give your body a chance to recover so that you can do more, more frequently, and increase your daily activity. So, the second half of the question is how do I accomplish the daily tasks I need to do? And that would be listen to your heart rate monitor. You know, my new mantra is listen to your heart. It doesn't lie. It always tells you the truth. You may not like what it tells you, but it tells you the truth. The same is true of athletes. A heart rate doesn't lie. If you find the next morning after you've done an activity that the heart rate is 10 beats above, normal resting levels, the heart rate hasn't recovered. So it's always right, which is what I love. And patients can improve their anaerobic threshold over time, I think, just through paying attention to this concept. And that's why we're spending so much time on it in our questions, because we could cover exercise and, you know, there were so many questions, great questions that came in from, from all of the patients that are 
involved in this webinar, we wanted to focus just on this one topic and really on anaerobic threshold because we believe that it's the key to functioning better, to improving quality of life, and to helping patients gain control over their illness. The second part of this question, or the first part, let's go back to the question, which is when I exercise, I can't do anything else for the rest of the day. We hear this all of the time. And the answer is you're doing the wrong type of exercise. If you can't do anything else, it's too much. Likely you've exceeded your anaerobic threshold, and that's not appropriate exercise. Appropriate exercise is exercise from which the patient recovers. And recovery is so important, and I think gets missed in this illness, that the patients need to recover adequately so that they can do activities. And when they feel they've overdone it, they shouldn't be in bed for the rest of the day. They should give themselves permission to rest before that happens so they don't end up in bed. And if an exercise program does that, it's the wrong type of program, the wrong type of activity. What we would recommend is to become smarter about activities and to be, learn to become more efficient. And that ties into how do I accomplish the tasks that I need to do. Exercise, should, appropriate exercise should help you to do more, not do less. And that should be a barometer. If you're doing an exercise program and not doing much else or not doing more than you were able to do before, there's a problem with that program. And, and here's the strategy that we recommend to help with that. Uh, energy conservation therapy really is a whole field, but it's extremely important. It focuses on teaching an individual to use that energy to get more accomplished. So it's learning to be efficient, learning to do activities smarter, and ways of doing this very practically are pacing. Plan rest breaks throughout the day, and then take those rest breaks, whether you feel like you need to take them or not. So sort of banking a little bit instead of just constantly overdoing, you take the rest break, which empower you to do more. One of our top tips that we give everybody is use a shower chair. Sit down in the shower instead of standing up. So if you can do an activity sitting down rather than standing up, it will save you 25% of your energy. It takes 25% more energy to stand than it does to sit. We'll bake that energy. Sit down in the shower, and then you can do more. Put a shower chair or a stool outside the shower, grab a cherry cloth probe, and then you don't have to dry off. Now you save even more energy. So take an overview of all the activities you do, what body position is, and then how can you manage that body position to save energy? Other tips, uh, use a headset for the telephone or the computer. Recline, put your feet up. Now, this is counterintuitive to what everybody is telling you to do, probably. They're telling you, you need to exercise. You need to do more. What we're telling you is avoid post-exertional delays, and your life will be better. And there are very practical ways to do this, but they're difficult, and they're not intuitive. They're just the opposite of probably what you think you should do, and perhaps what your health care providers are reminding you or encouraging you to do. Um, Joint protection is, is another important area. If you have pain, if you're unstable, use a cane. Uh, use a disability parking tracker. I say use the power of blue because the power of blue will let you park close to where you need to go. Whoever is with you, they will love you because you get to park in the blue spaces that nobody else does and you have a legitimate reason to do so. Don't be embarrassed. You're sicker than most patients with heart disease. 
Chris said they won't give you a heart transplant. Now, we're not saying you have heart disease. We're just saying that most of our patients are so functionally impaired, you deserve the blue. So use it because you can do more if you park closer and then you don't have to waste your energy walking to get to where you need to go. Activity planning is also an extremely important thing. Learning to balance light and heavy tasks, not only throughout the day, but throughout the week and throughout the month. So don't do everything on one day and then crash. If you need to do the laundry, do one load of laundry and then do another load the next day. Balance that out. Now the tricky part is that this requires planning. But if you don't do all of your cleaning on one day, if you balance it out, stop when you're fatigued, you can get more done overall in your day and in your week. And you'll also be able to plan activities and not have to cancel them because you've overdone it and didn't know that you were going to overdo it. And it really gives you control. And it empowers you because you can say, then I can, you know, I've planned for this activity. I want to go have dinner with my friends. I want to go to a movie or watch a movie in. And you'll actually have the energy to do it if you practice these energy conservation techniques. Uh, um, before I address this question, an, an, an added benefit of, of avoiding post-exertional relapse is that you get the benefit of the highest AT that you're going to have. So, so Stacey already mentioned that sometimes we see in patients that, that they have an AT of, of one measure on day one and then a lower anaerobic threshold on day two. Uh, if you don't overtax yourself, you get to benefit from that higher anaerobic threshold every day. The other thing that we didn't talk about that, that works in a similar vein, that, that very often, even if we get similar anaerobic thresholds from day one to day two, I can almost guarantee that on day two, that occurs at a much lower workload. And what that means is that the person is working at a, le at a lower level and still using the same amount of oxygen. Uh, so that's a decrease in efficiency. So once again, if you avoid overtaxing the system, you get the benefit of a greater efficiency, and therefore you're better able to, to do things. Uh, I should feel better after exercise. Why do I feel worse, and why does the flu last for days? Well, as Stacey already mentioned, it means redefining what exercise is. Don't let somebody else define exercise for you. Uh, not some athlete or somebody selling some fitness products on TV. Uh, probably not your physician. Uh, you would hope that your physical therapist would be able to do it. But very often, they come from the same background that we come from. The, the athlete mentality that you have to push through pain and the harder you work, the, bit, the greater the benefit, that really does not work for the cell. And so redefine exercise and what we, we use the term um, restorative. Um, exercise that you recover from, not exercise that makes you feel worse. Um, and this, this is not unique to chronic fatigue syndrome, but that if athletes overexert themselves, very commonly they come down with something called overtraining syndrome or overreaching syndrome. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, this looks very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome. Generally with an athlete, it won't last for the rest of their lives, but for some of them can take months or even years to recover from a, a severe bout of overtraining. And it's very likely virally related. What we know, there's a lot of data out there to show that immediately after uh, strenuous exercise, the immune system is depressed. When the immune system is depressed, your uh, right for uh, viruses, bacterial infections, a variety of other pathogens to really multiply. Uh, and that uh, bring on a secondary set of symptoms. And very often, they look like a viral illness because they are a viral illness. It, it is the flu. It is associated uh, viral pathology. 
because either you contract the virus newly or it's a reactivated virus that's been dormant in your system for a while. So overtraining indicators look almost identical to the list that we included at the beginning of the presentation for indicators of post-exertional relapse or post-exertional uh, exacerbation of symptoms. An athlete only recover from overtraining if they stop exercising and they rest until they recover. Um, the question number 10 um, is, is sort of a little bit more of what uh, Dr. Snow was just talking about. The flu-like symptoms that occur in the post-exertional state um, are also uh, another complaint often is why do I have brain fog after exercise? And again, this is another common symptom of a CFS patient after they've overdone it. Um, basically, what this, this question is referring to is that there is uh, a reduced capability for organized thought, uh, reaction time, um, reasoning, or um, expressing um, emotion in, uh, in the post-exertional state. Um, and then, again, it, it does go a long way of sort of explaining what post-exertional malaise comprises. Um, the picture that you see here, um, we were trying to um, get at this idea of brain fog in the post-exertional state. So what we did is simply measured reaction time. And um, the three conditions that you see there, condition number one was a comparison between a group of patients that were diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and a group of um, healthy controls. And you can see their simple reaction time wasn't different. So brain function um, was no different between a, a control patient or control subject and CFS. But then what we did is um, all of the subjects did an exercise test. So we look at condition two, that was the day after they did an exercise test. And you can see the CFS patient had a prolonged or a slower reaction time. And I think it just illustrates quite simply that there is brain fog. There's a, a reduction in the capability to even just respond to a simple reaction time measure. And in condition number three there, that effect lasts um, for days after that single bout of exercise. So I think you need to recognize that overdoing it one time can have pretty profound effects on um, what's shown in the figure there is reaction time, but then what's referred to as brain fog is really related to um, post-exertional malaise and is a common symptom um, in chronic fatigue syndrome. And we have a bonus question. I get to do our bonus question um, because this is my favorite favorite part. My favorite question and my favorite thing to do. And that is the question is how do I explain this to others? So every patient that we see, we require they bring someone to drive them because we are inducing post-exertional symptoms. We know they're going to feel like crap. That is our intention. And so we make sure somebody has, is there to take care of them, get them to and from our facility. That also means we have a family member or a friend to talk to at the end. And so when we do a test retest, the first day is, is good. But for me, the second day is the best. It's like Christmas because I get to tell the patient what their story is and what their symptoms are without knowing anything about them because the numbers are very objective and they don't lie. So it's a very powerful tool for the patient, for validation, and for the family members. We also work toward educating physicians. They get our reports. We're happy to educate and talk to them and attorneys. And so let me give you an example of a patient that we had recently. He's a 29-year-old male, a former athlete. Uh, he came in and did the testing on day one, and, and his numbers were very low. And he said, you know, that felt really good. I enjoyed the exercise, but I'm not feeling any symptoms right now, and I, I don't think you're going to see anything tomorrow. Usually my post-exertional life doesn't kick in until three or four days later. So, you know, I'd be really surprised if anything changed. Well, he came back in the second day, and I was able to sit down with him and his wife and go over the results. And on day two, his peak oxygen consumption, which is the total aerobic capacity, had dropped 10%, as well as his oxygen utilization at his anaerobic 
threshold. So both his uh, ability to produce energy at peak exercise and at very low levels of work had dropped. But beyond that, his workload at his anaerobic threshold was very low. It was only about 30 watts of work on day one, which is the equivalent to powering a 30 watt light bulb. It was pretty dim, only 20% of predicted. But on day two, it dropped 88%. And so I was able to look at him and say, hey, this is what's going on. Your aerobic capacity is compromised. And not only is it compromised, on day two, it falls apart. So you're not the same person on day two because you have metabolic dysfunction. And in addition to your metabolic dysfunction, you have problems sustaining work. And then when you stress yourself, the next day, your ability to do work is so impaired that just getting to our office, you are in anaerobic metabolism. This means you don't recover. This means you can't work a 40-hour work week. And it's devastating for me to tell a 20-year-old that they can't work, that they're not functionally impaired. But what I was able to say is, is hey, this is where you are. Now, I looked he and his wife in the eye and I said, is this your experience? And he said, how did you know? I can't believe that you can tell me this because I've been to see 60 doctors in the last five years, and they haven't told us anything close to this. And so for me, it's, and for Chris and for Mark and I, it's so empowering to say, here are your numbers. This is where you're functioning right now. And then to turn it around and say, here's what you can do about it. Here's your heart rate at your threshold. Go get a heart rate monitor. And right now, you can begin to control this illness and live your life a little bit better. And so that's, that's why we do this, um, because it really makes a difference in patients' lives. It gives them objective information that they can use not only for disability, which we really backed into. That wasn't our intent at all, to do disability evaluations, right? We're an exercise science department and, and typically work with athletes, but patients needed it. And the downside to that is we, we have to work with attorneys. <laughs> yeah, and that's a joy. Actually, believe it or not, there are some fantastic attorneys that are very compassionate. But I mean the attorneys who work for the insurance company. Okay, they're, 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 they're very fantastic. <laughs> All right, so how do I explain this to others? Um, our follow-up, sort of our conclusion slide, um, because we deal with this in disability evaluations all of the time, th these questions come up consistently. So, Mark, would you handle number one? Yeah, many skeptics just say post exertional malaise is because of detraining or deconditioning. And um, certainly, the results of our exercise testing, if we were to do just a single exercise test, the low numbers, for instance, for oxygen consumption, um, could indicate deconditioning. And it wouldn't be surprising or if you have a patient that reduces their physical activity to be condition. But the test retest data that we do does allow us to separate the effects of deconditioning. And then what are the fatigue effects that are produced by post-exertional relays? And it's fairly compelling evidence that post-exertional relapse is not simply explained by deconditioning alone. And Mark, would you just answer, how is this different from other illnesses, like heart disease or lung disease? Because in our studies, we look at healthy sedentary control, but how would a heart disease patient do on a test retest? Yeah, there's quite a bit of data um, that we've collected here and read in the literature that even patients with uh, very, very disabling illnesses, they do show evidence of deconditioning, but the deconditioning is very consistent. Um, one exercise test or one testing day to the next, um, there are no differences, whereas in the CFS patients, there's uh, a fairly profound difference between one day and the next, and, the next. and we think that's really good evidence uh, metabolically or cardiovascularly to explain the mechanism for post exertional malaise that is unique to CFS. And then the second point is that post exertional relapse is not explained by obesity. 
And, and we seem to see two sets of patients. Either patients tend to be underweight or tend to be overweight. And often in our disability reports, for our patients that are overweight, the opposing counsel for the insurance companies will say, well, they're just overweight. They're obese. And our rejoinder to that is that obese individuals can reproduce exercise test results. They're deconditioned, like Mark just mentioned, but 67% of our American society is overweight. And yet they're working 40-hour weeks with no problems. Uh, and so obesity itself with the test retest really is not a factor. If there are differences in post-exertional malaise, that means that that's unique to this chronic fatigue syndrome condition. Go ahead, Dr. Bennett. Yeah, while we're talking about um, the effect of deconditioning, um, Kim McClary had emailed us a question that asked about coenzyme Q10. And coenzyme Q10, the, the question was, is it good for AT joint? And um, that's kind of a compelling question for us because coenzyme Q10 is one of the coenzymes or the, the, the cytochrome that's involved in aerobic metabolism. And the data from our lab and other people's labs does show that aerobic metabolism is impaired, um, like Chris was mentioning earlier. Um, interestingly, in, in terms of coenzyme Q10, um, it probably is not a limiting factor, and so supplementing with it um, probably does not um, uh, improve aerobic uh, functioning. In fact, there aren't any um, placebo-controlled uh, double-blind studies that show that coenzyme Q10 is helpful for aerobic metabolism or for AT joints. So even though deconditioning or the use of oxygen in terms of metabolism seems to be a problem to get that patient, supplementing with coenzyme Q10, um, coenzyme Q10 probably isn't helpful for correcting that aerobic deficit. For us, motivation is not a problem, but, but, but for many people, they view chronic fatigue syndrome as, as malingering. And so we have to address that issue in our exercise uh, reports. Um, we do a maximal exercise test two days in a row, and there, there are indicators in that test that cannot be cheated. But, but we know if the person's giving 100% effort or, or not. And we let people know at the beginning of the test that we, we will not be able to realize the good report if you don't give good effort on the test. We never have a problem with patients getting good at it. They're not unmotivated. In fact, it surprises me that very often they'll hit their anaerobic threshold, remember that trigger point for symptoms, very, very early in the test. And then they will push themselves right until the end, until they're actually falling off the bicycle. And we've, we've had a number of incidents where you know, we frighten the grad students because we've had patients you know, collapsing on the exercise bike. I mean, it's not amusing. It, it's Period. But motivation is not a problem. Um, where we have a bigger issue with motivation is with our control subjects when we do research. Uh, you try getting a sedentary individual that doesn't exercise to do two maximal exercise tests 24 hours apart. Uh, they don't want to come back the next day and do the same uh, Persons with chronic fatigue syndrome never complain. Uh, they, they even ask us, do you want me to go harder? I and mean, we, we often have people that, that they have so low performance on test one, we say, uh, you don't need to come back day two, we can write up the report without a, a second day of data. They say, oh, no, no, if, if you want me to come back, I'll come back and do it again. It, it, it's absolutely unbelievable that, that the length that the people will go, not only to, to illustrate to themselves that they're sick, I think a lot of it is that, that they bought into the the height that they're not really sick, and maybe at the back of their mind, they think, maybe it is psychological. I, I can tell you it isn't. Um, and so motivation is not a problem for us. And the last uh, comment we have to, to address is depression. Well, they're just depressed. Um, well, they may well be depressed. Uh, you know, if, if I was that sick, I mean, I, I'm a fairly depressive person anyway, but if I was that sick, I would be depressed. So it's, it's not unsurprising that people feel down uh, a fair percentage of the time. But primary depression, and there are numerous studies to show with primary depression, that the response to exercise is very, very different. People who are depressed usually feel better after exercise, not worse. Um, exercise 
is a reasonable treatment for them. Uh, the drug studies with the antidepressants uh, in a person that with chronic fatigue syndrome that is also depressed, they may help with the depression. Generally, they don't help with the fatigue. In a person with primary depression, they help with the depression, and also they will help with fatigue associated with depression. So all of the standard explanations for chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms really don't match up with, with the data as we see it. And so to conclude, uh, we're strong believers that post-exertional life is real. It can be measured, and, and we're excited because we've objectively measured and quantified fatigue and post-exertional delay. And then the take home and the encouraging and exciting news for patients is that you can gain illness control, you can get a heart rate monitor, learn to pace your activities, and live your life better. And that's what we hope that you take home from this. It, 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 there is some good news. There is some light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, um, one of the questions that, that Kim asked is uh, over the line, I think Stacey's going to answer it because she has the answer up there, uh, was what makes our facility different from other facilities? Um, we, we started out as a standard exercise physiology lab, but, but our knowledge of chronic fatigue syndrome and the extensive testing that we did has made us modify our approach. And so, so we, we start on the premise that if anybody's coming the odds they're coming to see us because they're sick, not because they need an excuse not to go to work. Uh, and so what we're doing you're cutting out again, if you could, okay. uh, you're giving an important answer. I don't want it to be missed. Oh, okay, so uh, we start out with the premise that anybody's coming to see us that's going to put themselves through two days of torture is coming to us because they're sick, not because they want to get out of going to work or they want to get benefits that they're not entitled to. And so when we set up the test, we set up the test based upon this premise. And we're not trying to catch somebody out. We're just trying to support a diagnosis. Uh, we don't diagnose, we're not physicians, so people have come to us, interestingly, with a wide variety of diagnoses. Um, uh, we, we see a lot of patients with a Lyme diagnosis. Uh, it seems fairly arbitrary whether they get a chronic fatigue syndrome di diagnosis or a fibromyalgia diagnosis. Our experience is that most of our patients suffer fatigue. Most of them have pain. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether they get FMS diagnosis or the CFS diagnosis. Uh, we've had uh, multiple cirrhosis patients. We've had HIV patients. We've had post-cancer patients. Interestingly, most of those other conditions don't show a second-day deficit on the test, no matter how low-functioning they might be on day one. And I think the other thing that makes us unique is that we have a lot of experience in doing the test-free test. And while this is a standardized test that has been around for 50 years or longer, it, it's considered the gold standard in medicine as well as in exercise science, not a lot of people do it two days in a row because there's no reason to do so in any other disease state. And there are a lot of different subsets and many different profiles that our patients will show. So we don't always get the same thing. There are differences between patients in the results. Um, and we just have a lot of experience in interpreting those. So I think that's, that's one of the things that makes us very unique. Can you guys address, um, for those who, who would, uh, for whom it would be prohibitive to get to uh, Stockton, do you have colleagues in other places around the country um, who follow a similar protocol to yours? We have a colleague at Ithaca College uh, who is, is, has replicated our testing paradigm. Uh, in the Netherlands, Red Vermeulen uh, has replicated our studies and published them. Uh, primarily, I think it's research labs that have replicated this. And, and while any university with an exercise science department has this equipment, um, and many hospitals have this equipment, you know, the ability to do it should be there. 
The difficulty is finding someone that can accurately interpret the results and do the test properly. And, and so we've actually struggled to find places uh, that have really high quality control uh, that we trust their results. But most exercise science departments do a great job with the testing. It's the interpretation that's, that's slightly difficult. Because what happens is not supposed to be possible. And so it blows most people's minds. I, I just got an email from a, a patient from Switzerland who asked me to send them our protocol and they were going to have, send it to their doctor and have it done. And they did and sent me the results. Lo and behold, they had a beautiful test-free test effect. Uh, and their doctor was shocked and was, was just amazed that they went into anaerobic metabolism early. So clearly they did it correctly. The doctor knew what they were doing. And they got the same results that we did. So it's entirely possible to do this anywhere and re replicate it all over the place. But it has to be done well. Right, and I'm getting a lot of people asking if you guys can teach your um, colleagues how to do this, and, and I will say I know that all three of you have been very active on the um, speaking circuit, speaking at uh, professional meetings about this test-retest protocol. Um, so we just, we just need to get the word out. We, we never mind talking to people. Right, <laughs> as is evidenced here today, obviously. Um, several people have asked about heart rate monitors and what is the best kind, if there's a particular um, model or brand or whether the chest kind or the wrist kind, or I guess there's even a finger kind, um, which, what do you recommend as far as the heart rate monitor? And, and I think those are available pretty inexpensively now. They used to be um, sort of prohibitive cost-wise, but I think you can get them at Walmart and other places now. They're, they're not expensive. We, we have no shares in any of the companies. Um, we've, we've traditionally recommended Polar because that's what we use at the university, but they didn't come out as the best heart rate monitor in a recent uh, consumer review. Uh, I, I would suggest that people do their own research. That's what the internet's for. You know, find out which get the best reviews. Go and have a look at them. Try a few on. Uh, you know, not only has it got to look nice, it's got to be something you can wear. Can I keep this on? Can I utilize it? Uh, I'm not sure about the wrist ones, and I'm not sure about the finger ones, you know, the, the heart rate ones. The chest band ones are the ones that the athletes traditionally use. Um, they, they can be a little awkward and a little uncomfortable. They, they don't look good with an evening dress. but. You don't wear evening dresses that often, do you? No. Yeah. So you can be fine with those. I'm, I'm, I'm never with a heart rate monitor. Right. Absolutely not. So that, that's, a, that's a don't do. Evening dress, heart rate monitor. It's not only a scientific no, no, it's a fashion no. That's no. right. Um, so we didn't recommend one, but then again, we don't want to right. blame it. One doesn't work, so. Right, and it's going to never be back. I mean, that's, that's, that's the beauty of buy from Walmart and take it back. And then several people have uh, added the advice of make sure the alarm is loud enough because sometimes they're very muted and are hard to hear. Which right. to make sure everybody in the room can hear the alarm so that they know that you're overtaxing yourself. <laughs> If people are looking locally for some exercise testing, where should they start? Um, is this something that generally your internist or GP has to order, or whether uh, if you can go directly to an exercise science lab? Can you give some folks some guidance on that, please? Uh, this is this is Mark here. I guess I would I would be wary. Um, just like uh, physical therapists, oftentimes are programmed to push someone down their limits. Um, sometimes exercise physiology labs are uh, most comfortable working with athletes or people that are physically active. Um, so I think a place that has clinical exercise science experience um, is much better than one um, that's oriented towards the general public or those who are physical, physically active. Um, we found there's a lot of considerations that need to be taken into account when working with uh, the event population. So. Um, 
at best, um, please find someone that's sympathetic um, to the needs um, of CFS patients. Uh, Stacey, Chris, and I have all consulted um, with a number of different labs um, with some success and then um, not with others. Uh, other than Betsy Keller in, um, in, at Ithaca and, and the lab here, Stacey has done um, some testing elsewhere where she's traveled to a different site and consulted. Um, and that, that obviously is the most desirable. Stacey, you have anything you want to add to that? You know, we, we've had trouble overall in translating this to even very reputable uh, hospitals and universities because everybody has their own preconceived ideas. Now, it's a simple thing to do. It's just not easy. So let me tell you of a positive example. Uh, Allison Vested, Dr. Vested in Toronto, who now she's moving to Vancouver, uh, hooked me up with an exercise physiologist. And I rolled my eyes and thought, here we go again. But I said, sure, I'd be happy to talk to her. We had a conference call. And this woman was a physical therapist who was a PhD exercise physiologist, right? So that's our dream, someone that can speak our language. The problem that we have is when you go to a medical facility and they have a medical technician running the test, someone that doesn't have a background in this, and, you know, really they just push buttons. They don't know if they're getting good data. And we never know. If someone does a test and sends us the results to interpret who did the test? Did they do any maintenance on the equipment? Was there good quality control? And it, it's pretty sophisticated equipment, and so it needs to be maintained. So there are good success stories, um, and, and then there are difficulties. And I think that it's buyer beware, just as it is with any physician, you've got to find the good location and go there. You've got to find a good physician and see them. And so you've got to find somebody that knows what they're doing because we've sent patients to very good facilities that have even done very good tests, and then the interpretation they get because they don't have any cardiac problems or pulmonary problems, the doctor will say, the test is normal. And we look at it and we say, no, 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 it is not normal. So, again, just like Mark said, beware. Fire beware. Uh, um, we never see a patient without a physician referral and without a risk assessment. Um, so there, there, are, there are issues. Uh, it's not something you can just walk in off the street um, and ask to do a test. Uh, there were several questions um, uh, about the overlap of orthostatic intolerance, that's an, um, an inability to tolerate upright posture, and post-exertional relapse, and whether there's a way to tell when it's orthostatic intolerance versus um, pushing beyond energy or mental um, capacity limits. Do you guys have any uh, guidance on that. I know if we ask some of the autonomic experts, they might answer differently, but your perspective uh, is the one we're interested in today. Well, I think orthostatic intolerance is a significant problem, especially on that question number 10 when you're talking about uh, brain fog. Just getting enough uh, brain perfusion during changes in posture is important. Um, you also mentioned earlier um, the the space of the beta blockers, if you have beta blockers that are preventing um, tachycardia syndrome, they're going to be occurring in the heart rate response um, as well. Uh, I think the, the best response to that is you need a tilt table test um, in order to diagnose orthostatic intolerance. And even then, it would be at a clinical level where I think uh, a lot of CFS patients have um, mild or moderate orthostatic intolerance that they seem to manage. When Stacey talked about um, some of the postural things, um, being seated or even being recumbent if possible, I think what you're doing there is present, preventing um, orthostatic um, difficulties uh, in terms of being able to diagnose completely or separate the effects um, uh, between OI and just those exertional delays. I think that would be difficult to do because I think they interact. Um, uh, I think OI is a component of those exertional delays for sure. Uh, but for me, it doesn't explain the range of symptoms that, that we see in patients post-activity, and it doesn't ex explain the extreme fatigue that we, that we see. And certainly, it can explain some of the consequences of the test, but uh, I, I think it's just uh, in a 
long list of, of things that, that occur after exertion. Yeah, and uh, while I don't have uh, the fancy letters after my name that you guys do, um, what I always tell people is avoid the situations where you get sort of the, the double or triple threats. Um, Chris, you mentioned showering and, and standing in a warm environment um, can provoke orthostatic intolerance and post-exertional relapse. So maybe take a, a cool bath instead of taking a shower or you know, make the shower as short as possible so that you're not sort of layering on the effects of overdoing it and being in an environment where the orthostatic intolerance is likely to be triggered as well. Yeah, it's like it only hurts when I laugh. Well, right. Let's do any jokes right. then? Right. And we're getting a lot of questions from people who aren't familiar with the term orthostatic intolerance. Um, we'll be sending out an email um, probably tomorrow, maybe Saturday, when the uh, recording is uploaded. And we will include some links to written materials on the web about uh, the topic of today's webinar. And we'll also add some to or about orthostatic intolerance as well, because that's, that's another important thing that um, sometimes people hear for the first time and haven't heard it uh, being linked to CFS before. And we're, we're past our time, but there were um, several requests for one of you to just review again as people think about getting these heart rate monitors, if you could step through that process of how to figure out where the level is that they should not exceed if um, they don't have access to the kind of exercise testing that you do. You did that nicely. I think it was Stacy who did that before. If you could just repeat that again for the benefit of folks so that they um, can take it in one more time, that would be helpful. So, Kim, we discussed this yesterday because I kept trying to get Stacy to, to say a number. And, uh, <laughs> she, no, no, no numbers. If, if, you, if you understand that the number on the exercise test can fluctuate one day to the next, it can be very difficult to pick out a number. So I, I kept saying, well, Stacy, what about 110? What about 120? Um, and, and things she kept coming back to today is it's difficult with the fluctuation, it's difficult with someone taking um, beta blockers. So I think we kind of dodged around that one, but if you're going to start with something, go ahead and take um, try to handle that. Uh, well, I think two things. What we tell patients is get a heart rate monitor and, and start monitoring on a good day and on a bad day so that you can see what things elevate your heart rate excessively. If you can't talk comfortably and do an activity, if it starts to feel hard, that's it. Don't wait until you have the symptoms. Stop before it gets hard. So really what you're left with is perceived exertion. So tune into that. Rarely is, have I ever seen with our patients a heart rate at anaerobic threshold over 120. Usually it's much, much lower. It's anywhere from 90 to 110 or 15. And that, you know, 115, 120 is really high. It is always, always lower than the patients think it is. So start low. You know, err on the I we always say err on the side of caution and be successful. Set your heart rate monitor at 90. And then if you're successful, do your activities and have no symptoms, then bump it up to 95 and see how you feel. So keep that log, and with the log, put in your activity, your body position what your heart rate is at that body position, and most importantly, how did you feel? Was, it, was that activity hard or was it easy? Was it fairly light or was it somewhat hard? And when you start getting into that red zone of it's difficult, that means it's too much. And I know it seems like we're making excuses, but we will often see in patients where their anaerobic threshold occurs within less than 20 beats of their resting heart rate. And, and so it's not long before they've gone from a resting heart rate to the anaerobic threshold, and, and people are not going to be sensitive to that happening. It's, so it's why we're reluctant to just say, that here's the mathematical formula, it, it, it's very individual. And, and, and I think patients are, are, are capable of, of understanding their own body enough to recognize 
when they start to feel uh, getting close to, to that wall uh, and, and just make a note, where's my heart rate? But when I start getting close to that, that area that I know I'm going to be sick tomorrow. And a few questions have come in about whether <clears throat> the heart rate monitor will help with mental exertion. And unless it's a, a really newfangled kind of heart rate monitor, it may not. <laughs> but I just want to confirm with you guys that it's not, it's not all that helpful um, for sedentary activities or emotion, emotional um, challenges that may also <clears throat> excuse me, tax your Oh, energy levels, but it's not an area that we've looked at extensively. But, but uh, as Mark said earlier, that this idea of a, of a stressor it does not have to be a physical stressor. It can be uh, a cognitive stressor, and, and it, it'll elicit a heart rate response exactly the same way that a, a physical stressor would be. So I'm not guaranteeing this, but people may find that when they're cognitively stressed or they're trying to, to Think something through, and they find that their heart rate goes up to, to a level commensurate with, you know, with a, a, a physical activity. Yeah, I recently had a patient tell me that watching TV, their heart rate is 130. Well, clearly that's over the anaerobic threshold. Uh, I don't know what they were watching on TV, but but certainly doing certain computer work, watching TV, all of those events can clearly cause a heart rate response. It would be on cable, I should imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> okay. Um, I've got one last question, and then we will wrap up. Um, you mentioned uh, CoQ10. There not being much in the way of uh, literature to support that CoQ10 will be helpful. Um, in treating post-exertional malaise. Are there any things that you all know of recognizing you're not physicians um, that, that you have found there to be evidence to support like oxygen supplementation, um, any supplements or medications that seem to treat this, uh, or is it all the, the very challenging um, process of, of trial and error and energy conservation and energy management? Well, I, I think one of the things that uh, David Bell recommends is saline. And uh, we certainly recommend adequate hydration prior to testing and post-testing. Um, and salt and fluid loading is certainly helpful. It's helpful with athletes. Uh, for Dr. Bell's patients and if patients have the luxury of getting a liter of saline for two or three days after an event, or to see if, if that helps post-exertional malaise. We've had anecdotal reports that that's very helpful. We have not been able to do, a, you know, extensive studies on that. And then, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. There are all sorts of ergogenic aids that athletes use that work to give them more energy. Now, whether or not they work in a CFS population, whether or not they're legal, you know, those are different questions. But, you know, certainly there are things that work, and usually the safe things that work in the athletic population, we will often recommend for our patients. Uh, the general recommendations that, that, that are there to help keep the immune system functioning at a high level are well worth following anyway. Uh, you know, the, the evidence that there's an immune connection is, is so strong. And, and many conditions rely on a, a high level of immune function. So HIV patients will have a, a, a diet that is designed to boost the immune function. We don't think that would be any harm for anybody. The, the whole literature on supplements it is, is such a gray area. And, and, and even if you go on buy a supplement, you don't know that it's the same supplement from store to store, and so it's very difficult to collect data on that. You know, the FDA have enough problems, and they don't even look at this stuff, so. So we're loath to make any direct recommendations about anything. Um, 
as a general rule of thumb, if it's not going to do you any harm uh, and it, it's not breaking the bank balance and you, and you try it for a month and it makes you feel better, then it's probably worth continuing with. If you try it for a month and there's absolutely no perceived difference, then save your money. As with uh, many other things in CFS, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, and, the, and there's a lot of snake oil being peddled as well, which is troubling. Yes. Yes. Well, at the risk of um, overstaying our welcome with both our speakers and our audience, um, I'm going to wrap up here and thank you all three so much for the preparation um, and reviewing the hundreds of questions that came in and narrowing it down and giving uh, everyone such valuable information from your uh, very expert perspective on this really important topic. We do have several resources on post-exertional malaise that are already available on our website. I've listed the um, URL here. They're kind of all nicely grouped in one spot, uh, including several articles from the Pacific Fatigue Lab group on their testing and uh, energy conservation and uh, energy envelope is what it's referred to in a couple of the articles. If you think of your energy as, as having uh, kind of an envelope, staying within that envelope and not exceeding its boundaries, um, that's an maybe an easier concept to grasp than anaerobic threshold. Uh, but you'll find those on our website here. They were in the emails that you should have received after registering and uh, as reminders for today's program. So if you don't want to take that down, you should have it already. And we will send it out again in the follow-up email. Um, hopefully today's webinar recorded successfully. And we'll won't know that until it's over. And we'll get that posted to our YouTube channel within a day or two. And we also um, invite you to sign up for email updates to both our researchfirst.com site and also uh, a monthly e-newsletter that we send out uh, around the first Wednesday of each month called Research First News that groups up the information and tries to put it in an easily digestible format for you once a month, if not more often. Um, if you're active on Facebook, please join us there. We've got about 7,500 people. Um, and posts regularly throughout the day, just about every day. And we're also on Twitter. And as I said, YouTube is where you can find recordings of past webinars and where we'll post today's webinar recording, uh, hopefully within the next 24 hours. We also have a couple of other publications for donors. Uh, receive a print publication called Solve CFS. And that comes out two or three times a year. The spring issue is our most recent. We have a Catalyst in Action e-newsletter that talks about um, the work that the organization is doing and how we're uh, fueled by the people, both staff, advisors, board members, and our donors. And we're hosting a series of Catalyst Cafe events around the country. And I uh, enjoyed chatting with a few of the past participants of those Catalyst Cafe events from Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco um, during today's webinar when the speakers were speaking. So uh, donors should look for information on, on those publications as well as those events. And we thank you for supporting the work of this organization because it not only fuels our research program, which includes important work like the Pacific Speed Lab has done, um, but also makes programs like today's possible. So we invite you to express your support that way as well. And then just a final wrap up. <clears throat> we are. Um, 25 years uh, of service to this order, to this community and are um, continuing to work hard. We're focused now on research and funding our Research Institute Without Walls that will hopefully uh, lead efforts to identify disease-modifying treatments for CFS so that at some point we won't have so much guesswork and trial and error involved. It will be much more straightforward to how to treat this illness and improve the lives of people with it. And so we thank everyone for their support of the organization through the years and moving forward um, as we now are focused to research, and particularly treatment-related research. And with that, I'll close. Thanks again, Stacy, Mark, Chris, and to our large uh, audience that shared with us through some technical difficulties.
copies and uh, hopefully the recording will be available within a day or two and you'll hear from us by email about where to find that. Any last comments, guys? No, thanks for the uh, uh, opportunity to do this, Kim. Appreciate it. Yeah, you know, happy happy to make it available. And um, thanks so much. I hope everyone has a, a good afternoon. Does not exceed their anaerobic threshold very often for the rest of the day. And take this activity today into consideration when you're planning out the rest of your afternoon and evening. Because uh, even though you may have been listening only and reclined and recumbent, um, it still factors into your energy envelope and will affect probably how much you can safely do for the rest of the day. We thank you for making that sacrifice to join